Dr. Mark Pasternak is Chief of Pediatric Infectious Disease at Mass General Hospital, and here with his talk, what is an infectious disease expert? Dr. Mark Pasternak. I don't have any slides on what an infectious disease expert is. We study, uh, diagnose, and treat infectious disease. When I was in training, I was said we know everything, I was told we know everything there is to know about infectious disease except three things. What drug to use, what dose of medication to give, and how long to give it. Um, and it really, in some ways, hasn't changed. Uh, I don't have much in the way of conflicts of interest. Um, I was asked to speak uh, about the role of infectious diseases in, in uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, and this is a slide that you can see at the bottom. Um, was just published uh, recently at the, uh, it's a collaborative study, a multi-center study. Uh, my colleague uh, Kyle Williams was heavily involved in this. And it just demonstrates that um, among individuals who have OCD symptomatology, the frequency in the background, the, the uh, medical history, not only shows an increased uh, incidence of a variety of infectious diseases, some of which are clearly streptococcal in nature, such as uh, scarlet fever and acute rheumatic fever, um, but other serious infectious disorders, as you can see. And the power of this study was that it looked at a large population of healthy people who did not have OCD symptomatology and showed that the, the incidence of infections of certain classes or of inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis uh, or of asthma was higher in this population than in, in others. Again, suggesting there's a theme that, that inflammation and prior infection triggers uh, downstream neuropsychiatric disorders. Interestingly, the first degree relatives of these individuals also had a higher rate of, of certain classes of infectious or inflammatory disorders, uh, which speaks to the genetic component in a crude way. Um, but it's not coincidental, I would say, that certain problems run in families, and pandas uh, is actually a classic example where siblings, multiple siblings, can be affected in a single family. Number one, they share a genetic background. Number two, they're coughing all over each other. They're wrestling, they're uh, sharing everything, and um, the incidence of strep in the household is, is uh, much increased. I'm gonna say a few words about streptococci. Uh, this is, if I get, have one take-home infectious disease lesson, is it is that group A streptococci in particular, which we think about as, quotes, the cause of pandas, is not a homogeneous pathogen. It is a family of related germs, the biology of which we don't understand very well in many cases, and the notion that new clinical syndromes can suddenly appear uh, and be due to group A strep is, is widely accepted when it involves flesh-eating processes and things like that. But when it involves neuropsychiatric disorders, it's, it's hit against resistance uh, in the medical community. So group A streptococci in general look like this under the microscope, strep, strep form chains. They're round organisms that form chains. They look a lot like staph, except staph grow in clusters. Uh, and they can be biochemically distinguished. Um, streptococci, have a variety of enzymes that they make, proteins that do things, and you can see that beta hemolysis, uh, the, the red blood cells that are included in the agar on this little culture dish, uh, are, are lysed by, by certain streptococci, and others uh, make a green pigment in the middle, and some do nothing. And our focus is gonna be on the beta hem hemolytic strep. But beta hemolytic strep is not a homogeneous population. Rebecca Lansfield, uh, in the first part of the 20th century, uh, classified beta hemolytic strep um, by their surface uh, immunological properties based on variation in their, car in their surface carbohydrates. Uh, she identified 20 groups, and a group A strep is, is the elephant in the room, the gorilla in the room. It's the most important, um, and uh, it's uh, known as uh, strep pyogenes. We know that it's the most important uh, because different strains of hemolytic strep are carried in the pharynx in individuals. This was work that was done, as you can see, um, 70 years ago or so. Uh, there's a variety of, of streptococci of different uh, Lansfield groups present in the pharynx among hospitalized, uh, among hospitalized patients and in a control group among uh, normal uh, asymptomatic individuals. And although group A strep was more common than some of the others, if you look at patients who are hospitalized with respiratory illness, uh, group A strep represented 90% of the infections. So although we occasionally see serious 
respiratory infection is due to uh, non-group A strep. Group A strep is the man. It's really the, the main pathogen. Uh, it has uh, a capsule that um, determines the different Lancefield groups. Uh, it has uh, these fibers or, or pili that have virulence factors that make it difficult for our bodies to fight the infection. And it releases a boatload of different products that are destructive to the host, that is to us. Um, group A strep has tremendous diversity. And the reason is that those, uh, those uh, hair-like uh, pili are largely composed of something called the M protein. There are, at least by genetic screening, uh, something over 220, probably over 230 different M proteins. And so when people say, well, group A strep can't possibly do this or can possibly do that, we're not talking about one germ. We're talking about a huge family of pathogens. And so I take any negative comments with a grain of salt, and I say, until you provide the strains that, and subject them to molecular analysis, we don't know what you're talking about. And I wish we could identify and harvest and study all the strep isolates that provoke symptoms in our patients, in our children. Um, but unfortunately, in this modern era of rapid strep testing, we rarely get positive cultures because um, no one bothers to grow it if the th rapid test is positive. And if by the time a child comes to my office, that isolate of strep from the pharynx is probably long gone. Um, and so I can't uh, do medical archaeology and recover, and recover the strain. This shows that, as we all know, group A strep is common in the winter. Um, and it shows along the bottom, I may not project well, but there are a number of different M proteins. Number one is the most important, most common. Um, but even if you look at the 20 most common strains, it only represents about 90% of, uh, of um, isolates. The point is there are a lot of different streps circulating. But in any given community at any given time, there's often one dominant strain that season. Uh, and this shows that uh, this was in a, in a discrete uh, community. Uh, where the children went to school together and the parents um, lived in, in close quarters on a military base, um, that, that uh, a particular M protein, number one, uh, was, the, was the dominant player uh, in 1999, but in the year 2000, M6 was, was the dominant player. And if you had M1 infection the year before, you were not immune to getting M6 infection the next year. In other words, our immunity to strep is very much M protein type specific. It's not a universal uh, reaction, which is one of the reasons it's been so hard to develop a vaccine against group A strep. What do you use as your target to make a vaccine? I also want to mention that there are, there's a strain of, of uh, group A strep that would ordinarily have been considered a common strain, the M1T1 strain. Um, as you saw from a sl few slides ago, it was very, very common. Um, but in fact, uh, there's a clone of M1T1 strep that is lethal. Uh, it's called hypervirulent, meaning it's really bad, and associated with invasive tissue infections, necrotizing fasciitis, uh, the, the uh, uh, trigger for a streptococcal toxic shock syndrome, which could be rapidly fatal in its own right. And the mechanism for this has been largely elucidated. It turns out it's way complicated. I have trouble reading the papers. You were talking about difficult papers to read before. Um, there are bacterial viruses called phages that are able to carry extra genetic material, and some of these viruses have infected this strain of group A strep and brought additional virulence factors on board. And um, the net result is that these, uh, this strain is, is uh, really, really destructive and probably was the strain that was involved in the uh, days of children dying of scarlet fever back in the first half of the 20th century. Um, because we know that some of those strains are M1T1 strains, and yet for the middle third or middle two-thirds two of the century, people said strep throat, what's the big deal? Um, they just didn't uh, have invasive uh, features. Some appreciation of the diversity of, of group A strep can be seen on this slide, where different strains tend to have different properties. So the strains that cause acute rheumatic fever uh, can be characterized, some strains uh, can produce glomerulonephritis after getting a sore throat. And other strains don't commonly cause sore throat, but they cause skin infections that lead to the development of an immune uh, glomerulonephritis, a kidney inflammation uh, process. Um, and you can see there's some overlap, but, but there's a lot of different things that happen depending on the strain. So group A strep is a strictly human pathogen. It doesn't survive very well on environmental surfaces. Uh, and um, it's not very stable in the environment. It spreads person to person through droplet. Uh, 
spread. And you all know that because kids go to school and other kids have strep and your child comes home with strep or a symptom flare. The problem is that very often the person shedding the strep is asymptomatic and so you have no clue or no warning that, that a child's exposed to strep. Um, but the bacteria have uh, a variety of special molecular features that promote their role in causing infection and impair the ability of the host to, uh, to fight infection. Uh, they make a lot of extracellular products. These enzymes that, that lyse cells, they dissolve them. They're like detergent. Um, and that's why we see that hemolysis, uh, that clear zone on the culture plates. Uh, some of the enzymes liquefy pus, which is normally thick. Um, and it makes it into a liquid and allows the strep to travel rapidly through the tissues. And this uh, is thought to be important in some of those tissue invasive infections. Uh, and um, some of the products are, are called super antigens. Normally, a, Immune cells are turned on by the immunological properties of the bacterium or, or foreign protein or an allergen or whatever. Um, superantigens activate huge numbers of white cells uh, through non-immunological means, and this is the basis for streptococcal toxic shock and staphylococcal toxic shock um, because so many T cells are activated that the body can't cope with the, with the stimulation. I'm gonna give a little overview of some of the different uh, infections that uh, strep can cause, and I will focus initially on skin infections because as you can see, there's a lot going on. This is really uh, sort of a paradigm of uh, the kinds of infection that strep most commonly cause. So this is impetigo, it's a very superficial infection. It's recognized by the honey-colored crust that's present uh, here. Strep infections of the skin almost always follow some innocent, trivial uh, primary injury, whether it's eczema that leads to a little bit of scaling and breaks in the skin, whether it's an insect bite, whether it's a, a small laceration or an abrasion on the athletic field. Um, it doesn't just invade perfectly healthy skin very often. The problem is the germs are microscopic. The injury can be microscopic and people may not recall or know why they, they developed an infection. This is called ecthyma. Uh, this is a deeper infection of the skin. The layer between the epidermis and the dermis uh, is breached. And so what starts out as a Pustule evolves to form a deeper infection and leads to a, a, a little scar that forms. Uh, this is several pictures uh, representing perianal strep infections. Uh, this is neither cellulitis nor uh, ecthyma uh, because this can be present for weeks. Uh, and children sometimes have no symptoms. They certainly don't have fever or any signs of illness. Uh, and yet this is not unusually uh, a cause of a pandas flare. So the presence of this sort of red halo around the anus uh, is, is really quite common. And unless you look, you don't find. In younger children, it's easier to look. In older kids, they say, no, I'm fine, and there's no way you're gonna have a look. So, um, we, you know, it's like tick, tick checks in New England. You know, the, the little kids are easy to check for ticks. The older kids tell you to back off. So. Uh, erysipelas is a, a very dramatic infection of the skin. It has very sharp borders, a lot of swelling, pain, fever. It's a serious illness and often requires hospitalization. Commonly occurs on the face, um, but can occur in other parts of the body. Um, sometimes we can get group A strep out of the blood in cases of erysipelas. Cellulitis is a deeper infection. Um, this slide is supposed to show that the borders are more indistinct um, because it's working at a level of the skin that's not so close to the surface that you can see a sharp border. The borders here really aren't bad. Um, and uh, this too can be, uh, can be the trigger of hospitalization, although I think if someone just had that, they might uh, be managed as an outpatient. You may notice there's almost always some focus of infection in, in some of these things um, because the strep can't start an infection de novo very well or very often. This is lymphangitis. Uh, you can see uh, this patient had some sort of lesion on his thumb or her thumb. Uh, and then there's red streaking that follow the course of lymphatic channels through the course of the skin. This is a very rapidly progressive infection. You can actually take a magic marker and make a, a, a line here, and four hours later you can make a line here. Uh, this also requires hospitalization frequently and intravenous antibiotics. Necrotizing fasciitis, this is a terrible clinical picture on the left and a little diagram on the right. These are the deeper infections that, that we associate with flesh-eating uh, disease. Um, and looking at this, it doesn't look that bad, but there's often a kind of otherworldly discoloration of the skin, a sort of bronze purplish color, often associated with, with big blisters that are full of cloudy fluid. The main thing is extraordinary pain. Uh, there may or may not be a ton of fever, but the heart rate is up into the 150s or something. They're sick. 
Um, and people look at this and say, oh, you can go home on a little bit of Keflex or, or some other uh, oral therapy. It's because they're missing the boat. And people who have their boat missed uh, fall into the ocean. You can see from the schematic here, this is a surgical disease. You have to basically cut away the infected tissue. So the sooner the diagnosis is made, the sooner the patient goes to the operating room, uh, the sooner their limb and their life uh, is saved. And this is classic of, of flesh-eating bacteria. Um, streptococcal infection can, pro uh, can progress even deeper to the fascial layers that envelop the muscles and actually cause necrosis of the muscle. But they're all, all of these conditions are treated exactly the same. They're surgical diseases. The diagnosis hopefully is made in the emergency room and they go to the OR. Uh, and streptococcal uh, purpura fulminans is one of the causes of purpura fulminans. We see this with meningococcal infection uh, probably more commonly, but in this disorder, the blood vessels are actually thrombosed. There are blood clots to the arteries, uh, to the limb, and the skin turns black, and the toes and fingers turn black, and this is often associated with delayed uh, need for amputation. Patients can survive this, but they're often left uh, considerably disabled. Uh, there are what are called non-separative skin infections. These are the rashes that we see that are more of an immunological bent rather than an active infection where you can recover strep from the skin. Um, scarlet fever, uh, many of you may have seen. Uh, as I said, you know, 100 years ago, this was subject, kids were subject to quarantine. The doctors would tell the parents, your child has a 50-50 chance of surviving, and now we think of scarlet fever. What's the big deal? It's strep throat with a rash. Um, so it's a very a dramatic rash, as you can see. They described by texture as uh, being sandpapery, um, most commonly associated with sore throat. But it's also associated with what's called strawberry tongue, and with these, uh, you can see darkened lines in skin folds. There's bleeding into the skin at these sites, and colpasteas lines, and they're diagnostic of, of uh, scarlet fever. Uh, this is a picture of a child with guttate psoriasis. This is psoriasis, except it forms these little uh, lesions. Guttate means droplet or, or drop-shaped. Um, so they're small. Uh, there are many. They're not itchy. They're just gross. Um, and they uh, can occasionally follow strep infection by a few weeks. Uh, and this is a very educational photograph because it demonstrates that the focus of infection was a perianal uh, strep, and the child developed uh, guttate psoriasis. Uh, treating these children with long-term antibiotics actually goes a long way to um, prevent the rash from coming back. This is the rash of erythema marginatum. This is the skin manifestation of acute rheumatic fever. Uh, and you can see all these multiple circles. It almost, if you squint, you might say this looks like disseminated Lyme disease, but the lesions are not so well formed um, and often are, are associated with other manifestations of acute rheumatic fever. A strep can cause central nervous system infections. It can cause meningitis. Uh, it can cause infection of the spinal fluid in, in the, uh, along the spinal cord. Um, this may just be a direct extension of infection from a head and neck focus, like otitis media, into the mastoid bone and then into the central brain, um, or can uh, be related to sinus infections. Uh, strep can in infect the musculoskeletal system. This is a picture of a toddler who got sick and had strep grow out of his blood. And um, trust me, this is the MRI appearance of, of a septic knee, an infected knee, an infected hip. Um, and uh, he needed to have these things drained and, and uh, ultimately did well. Uh, but it's obviously it was a long and complex hospitalization. Uh, I mentioned that strep obviously uh, can cause pharyngitis and tonsillitis, but the infections can spread deeper into the throat. Uh, peritonsillar abscesses can rupture b through the back of the tonsil and lead to deeper uh, soft tissue infections of the neck. Uh, these are surgical disorders in, from, uh, in most cases and um, are actually potentially life-threatening because they can sometimes eventually track down into the chest and produce a condition called mediastinitis that is uh, immediately life-threatening. Uh, I mentioned these other foci, not that they're so dangerous, otitis media or sinusitis, except to say that we don't often get a positive culture. So a child can have otitis media and develop panda symptoms. And the pediatrician will say, well, the throat swab was negative for strep. Your kid doesn't have pandas. And in fact, they may have had a, a primary focus of infection in a site you can't culture. Uh, strep pneumonia is not common, but is very serious because it provokes uh, the elaboration of fluid that, that surrounds the lung and gets secondarily infected needs to be drained. Uh, There's a picture of a peritonsillar abscess. Uh, 
anytime one tonsil's big and one tonsil's small and there's throat pain, you should think about uh, peritonsillar abscess. This is a dramatic MRI that showed this patient had abscesses in both tonsils at once. We don't see that very often. Uh, this is a picture of group A strep pneumonia, and you can see that uh, there's a lot of fluid uh, that has accumulated here. Um, so I'll say a few words about acute rheumatic fever. This is the classic non-separative uh, or non-infectious uh, strep complication, an immunological complication. It's a multi-system disorder uh, affecting the heart, the joints, the, the central nervous system with the uh, production of chorea. Uh, and then skin disease in the form of subcutaneous nodules and uh, the rash that I showed you, erythema marginatum. There are some other features uh, that are called minor manifestations uh, that we look for as well. Uh, this typically follows group A strep infection by two weeks or so. Um, and if you treat a child even by the ninth day of symptoms, in principle you should prevent the development of acute rheumatic fever. Um, sometimes kids are kind to us and they present with a bunch of features all at once and it's like, it has to be acute rheumatic fever. What else could do this? But sometimes they just present with joint pain. And then a month or two later they may have chest pain or, or just have a, be short of breath and have evidence of carditis. Uh, or a child may just present with chorea out of the blue as his only manifestation. And um, it sometimes takes a little bit of clinical skill and, a, and respect for the possibility of acute rheumatic fever. It's an incredibly important diagnosis to make because these children are going to receive 15 years of antibiotics on average. And if their compliance is not 100% perfect, they need to get injections of bicillin for the next 15 years, every three weeks. If you just do the arithmetic, it's a lot of shots. Um, and so it's a very important diagnosis to make. I alluded to post-treptococcal glomerulonephritis. This is sort of strain-related. Uh, we don't always know which strep are going to do this, but we typically see it in the summertime after kids get an infected abrasion or one of those little superficial skin infections. Um, it comes on relatively soon after infection. Uh, Complement, which is an inflammatory system of proteins in the blood, are consumed. So you can get a blood test and see that the complement level is low. They have an inflammatory kidney disease. And if a kidney is biopsied for diagnosis, they have streptococcal antigens in the kidney. So the immune complex is kind of got trapped by the kidney filters and uh, the kids get high blood pressure and blood in their urine. Um, and in general, anti-DNA speed tests uh, help make the diagnosis more reliably than the ASLO. People think PANDAS is a new thing and you can say, well, of course it, it is with a 20 or 25 year uh, gestation. Um, but in fact, Sydenham's chorea, this is a picture of Thomas Sydenham, he reported on chorea, this uncontrollable movement disorder back uh, in the 17th century, uh, and uh, noted that kids had altered behaviors in association with, uh, uh, with chorea. Uh, this has been called by the lay term uh, St. Vitus dance. Well, I looked up what is St. Vitus dance. St. Vitus was the, was the patron saint of dancers. So it's kind of a tautology, but it's, uh, uh, it's a dramatic uh, presentation. It gets better over time, and he himself noted that the kids got better, and then sometimes they got it again, obviously, after a second bout of, of acute rheumatic fever. Um, it took hundreds of years, but eventually all the pieces of the puzzle fell together that Sydenham's chorea is a manifestation of acute rheumatic fever due to group A strep infection. Uh, and I listed here, just to point out, how long, if you have a bad case of acute rheumatic fever with carditis, um, you're given at least 10 years of therapy or until you're 40, um, which is whichever is longer. Um, kids with more modest disease are treated typically until they've uh, turned 21. Uh, this is a major, major um, commitment because heart disease and the need for valvular heart surgery it doesn't typically uh, develop after a single bout of acute rheumatic fever, but kids who have multiple bouts of acute rheumatic fever get progressive cardiac injury. So in places like the Philippines or Brazil or other places that are sort of in the middle level of, of income, um, there's enough crowding still and enough inadequate treatment of group A strep that we see this. Here in the States, the average pediatrician under the age of 50, I, I would be willing to say, has never seen a case of acute rheumatic fever unless they came from certain pockets of the country where they have been clonal outbreaks uh, uh, provoking this. So why does group A strep do this? The term molecular mimicry is an important concept. Uh, we can't say that this answers all questions, 
But basically, uh, we now know that many bacteria have, in the course of their protein structure, little snippets of protein sequences that happen to be identical or highly related to normal proteins in our own body. Um, and so the immune system is trying to attack the strep, and it turns out making antibodies and, and immune T cells uh, that, that attack the host as well. There are other mechanisms of molecular mimicry, some of which are based on just the confirmation or the protein folding features of the protein, uh, or even the carbohydrate, the sugar variants um, that are present. Uh, and so there are a number of ways that molecular mimicry can be established and lead to uh, basically post-infectious autoimmune uh, complications. Uh, this is a diagram taken uh, from uh, Dritan Aglu's uh, seminal work of infecting mice, which I told you are not the normal host of group A strep, as far as we know. Um, but if you give strep to, to mice week after week for a month, and then you sacrifice their brains, you can demonstrate that there's uh, encephalitis. These are infiltrating lymphocytes into the brain. It's not just some global diffuse inflammation. It's a very specific uh, inflammation in the front part of the brain, right behind where the nasal uh, immune tissue lives. Mice don't have adenoids, but they have the equivalent of adenoids. Um, and so there's this demonstrated, I think, to, to the world that, that the notion of autoimmune, of, of post-infectious autoimmune encephalitis as it relates to group A strep is a real concept. Um, and it's time to move on and, and work on the problem and not on its existence. So as an infectious disease doctor, you know, we like to know... Oh. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we like to know uh, what, what's causing the diseases we see. To say someone has pneumonia, we have no idea what you've got, but here's some antibiotics, let's keep our fingers crossed. It's, it's not satisfying to, to us. So um, it's the same way in seeing new patients who come in with a PANS kind of presentation, PANDAS presentation. Uh, I want to have you leave saying that where this dotted line is drawn, I, is very, very difficult because the tests are really inadequate to answer the question as presently available. Um, and so some people say it's not worth bothering, but I find it's worth bothering. Um, I'm just frustrated at the limitations of the testing. And what I mean by that is that the obvious things, diagnosing group A strep infection, either by culture, by antibody testing, um, and by uh, treating, all have uh, their limitations. So you can think of this as a clinical microbiological challenge. Here's a child who comes in with symptoms. What's the cause? You think, well, like all the other things, you know, you get a blood culture, you grow staph out of the blood. We know they have staph in their blood. Um, it's not so simple in this situation. Um, part of it is that kids may have seen their pediatrician for a sore throat. They may not have had a symptomatic sore throat. You can have all the bad post-infectious complications of group A strep and never know that you had a sore throat. So the triggering infection is not reliably uh, diagnosed and treated. Um, kids come to me, unfortunately, with a bit of a, of a lag in scheduling, so I don't see them necessarily in the throes of the acute episode. Uh, we know that kids who have pandas can have symptom flares uh, that are not due to group A strep. Maybe they shed their front teeth in second grade, um, or maybe they ha had a fractured bone and needed surgery. Um, and so uh, th at those times, there'll be a negative workup for strep, and so they say, well, this is, must be pans. Um, serological testing, as I'll show you, is, is imperfect. It's just not sensitive enough. For close to 100 years, the ASLO titer was the gold standard. And if it was negative, you were told your child didn't have strep. You're a carrier. He's a carrier. She's a carrier. Um, but in fact, the testing is, has false negatives, a substantial number of false negatives. Um, why does, do simple therapies, you know, the American Heart Association recommends amoxicillin, or PENVK to treat group A strep pharyngitis, but their failure sometimes as high as 40% or more. And the reason is that the neighborhood has changed. The pharyngeal microorganisms, the bacterial environment of the tonsils now has many, many organisms that have enzymes that degrade amoxicillin. Um, and so you have to use a, a more powerful antibiotic um, if you hope to eradicate the strep infection. And I listed here, and later in this, I'll, I'll show you some more details, but cephalosporins are commonly used. Amoxicillin can be given with an agent that prevents that degradation. Um, but the use of azithromycin and clindamycin have problems of their own because um, many group A strep are now resistant to these uh, therapies. So even though we used to think of clindamycin as, as the, the drug that always worked, in fact, it, only, it has an 80% success rate 
and azithromycin probably slightly less. I evaluate children, I look for strep, uh, we try to get a rectal swab if we can, we get a throat culture, and we do antibody testing. Uh, I look for uh, strep antibodies, I look for mycoplasma antibodies, and occasionally we've seen kids who've had classic Lyme disease who went on to develop a PANS-like syndrome. Um, uh, we check some other uh, immunological studies, mostly out of uh, curiosity uh, and not really with a direct management impact. Uh, so we've talked about a negative culture it doesn't mean that there's no pharyngitis. It means you didn't necessarily get a good enough swab. Um, and so we don't know is that a false negative because the child didn't want to get swabbed or that it was a true negative, that it was a good swab and there's no strep. Uh, we talked about antibiotic failures. We talked about the degradation of amoxicillin. But remember that beta-lactam antibiotics, penicillins, cephalosporins, can't penetrate cells. And Pat Cleary demonstrated that group A strep can actually hide inside cells uh, in the respiratory epithelium. And so antibiotics of this family won't work, or at least they'll be associated with relapse. Azithromycin does penetrate cells, but unfortunately more and more strep are now uh, becoming resistant. Uh, the diagnosis of, of group A strep pharyngitis, again, sounds like medical student level, you know, sophistication. Um, there's a, a scoring system called the center score. Uh, you look at it, and it's all the obvious things. Is your child febrile with a sore throat? Are, is there white exudate on the tonsils? Are there lymph nodes in the neck? Does, he, does the child lack other symptoms of a respiratory viral infection? And is it a kid as opposed to a grandmother? Um, and you get a point score, and it doesn't come out to be 100%. So uh, at the end of the day, you do the best you can, but, but a lot of patients will fail even with this uh, uh, scoring system. And this list lists some of the things that, that I ask about and that I look for. And I just want to point out somewhere here, it should say abdominal pain. Uh, I apologize if it doesn't, but, but bellyache as a symptom of group A strep infection, particularly in younger children, is quite uh, common. Uh, Gene Stollerman was a strep guru uh, of great renown and was heavily involved in some of the acute rheumatic fever uh, studies in the mid-century, last century. Um, and he pointed out that uh, two-thirds of streptococcal infections associated with an antibody rise, this meaning um, it was a bona fide strep infection, occur as subclinical infections with no symptoms. This was based on work done in a basic training camp in Minnesota where military recruits would always go to a sick bay if they had a sore throat, because they got a day off. Um, but some of them would not come in then, they would come in two weeks later with acute rheumatic fever. And the doctors would say, did you have a sore throat two weeks ago? Why didn't you come in and get treated? And they'd say, don't you think I would have been here if I had a sore throat? Um, and so silent primary infections could lead to serious late immunological complications. Um, and he made the point that antibody rise is really the currency um, that leads to the late complications. Um, but it's a hard diagnosis to make because some kids won't have symptoms. And antibody testing is not, is not the savior here because uh, this is uh, one, one very dramatic example. The black uh, markings represent ASLO and anti-DNASB, the two classic streptococcal antibody titers. Um, but, and you can see in this particular child, the numbers didn't do anything over a period of, of a year. Um, but if you look at antibodies raised against the M2 protein, which happened to be the strain, M2 strain of group A strep that this child had, um, and look at antibodies against another streptococcal protein, they had a classic rise in antibody titer. It turns out, if you look at sensitivity of this testing, uh, a rise in S ASLO titer is pretty pathetic. It's less than half. A rise in anti dnasb is about 50%. And it's only if you do these two tests and at least a few others of these research-based anti-strep antibody tests, you come out with a reliable, close to 100% serological diagnosis. The problem is these tests are not available commercially, and um, there's no laboratory uh, avenue to get them done uh, in general. Uh, so I'm going to spend the last couple seconds talking about, uh, about treatment. Um, I pointed out the long duration of therapy uh, as, as suppression for acute rheumatic fever, but I think of pandas as being in the same family. I tell parents, you know, the, the bad news is your child's going to need to be on longer-term antibiotics. The good news is not going to need it for 15 or 20 years. You know, we treat for a while, we see how they do, and we try to wean antibiotics off. Um, these are the doses uh, listed for uh, 
the conventional treatment, the injections of penicillin are really very low dose. And I think in the modern era of uh, beta lactamase production by throat bacteria, I, I worry that, that this may be associated with breakthroughs. Um, where you draw the line between pandas and pans is a complex one because the serological testing and the culture data may not answer the questions. It's important to me because if a child has documented pandas, they should do well on treatment for strep. If a child has pans, we tend to use more uh, azithromycin, which treats most strep and it treats most mycoplasma, but it's not perfect for either, and so it's a little bit frustrating. Um, and this is the guidelines for treating uh, using alternate agents, the more powerful agents that I've talked about. I, I don't use cefadroxyl. It's a once-a-day treatment, but I've had a high rate of failure uh, with it. Um, but I do use a lot of cephalexin, uh, and this dose uh, given twice a day is, is totally reasonable. Uh, I use um, a lot of amoxicillin clavulanic acid, augmentin, uh, at similar doses. Uh, to me, that's the gold standard for non-allergic children. Uh, the role of prophylaxis we've, we've talked about, um, that flares may be related to antibiotic breakdown. They may be related to, incre to uh, impaired absorption. I must say in my patient population, the compliance is good. In the general pediatrics practice, compliance with 10 full days of treatment is actually terrible because by day four or five, the kids feel well and they don't want to take their medicine and they get home late from soccer and they don't get around to it. And, um, but Pandas kids get their antibiotics. Thanks. Is that, am I right? Uh, so one of the things is that I tend to use higher dose treatment than the lower doses that are recommended by the American Heart Association to prevent acute rheumatic fever. I have simply found that when I use classic suppressive doses, I fail. The kids fail. They get relapses. Um, and I don't have a medical or microbiological explanation for that, but I assume it's related to some sort of sequestered focus of strep. So I tend to use a, a, a high higher doses uh, uh, than, than used. And we've talked about macrolides. Rifampin is a drug developed to treat tuberculosis. It's actually in a remarkably broad spectrum antibacterial antibiotic. It's very easy for microorganisms to develop resistance to rifampin if given alone, but if it's given in conjunction, say with amoxicillin clavulanic acid or cephalexin, um, it usually does not lose its, uh, its activity. It's not common that I use this, but you know, Patients with tuberculosis can be treated for six to 12 months with rifampin, so it's not inherently unsafe. Um, but I just list it as, as a possibility. And so some of the kids I see are kids who've not done so well on conventional management, even according to the consortium guidelines. And so on occasion, I have to kind of think outside the box. So I think that was last night. Great, thanks. I kept the schedule. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pasternak.